Thank you very much for being here this evening. Um, I'm real pleased and real honored to have this opportunity. I have participated in many, many, many celebrations over the years. Um, we first started doing this more than 20 years ago. The first one we did was at the History Museum. I don't know who remembers that, but all subsequent celebrations have been held right here in this space. Um, there's someone else, somewhere else? Yeah, we were up in the community center on Harlem Road for a couple of years. Yeah, that is right. We were right that is right for the school. One year? One year. I don't see you, Diane, but I hear you. Okay. <laughs> That's your school, right? I know the voices. Well, anyway, celebration is always a wonderful event. It's sponsored by the National Storytelling Network. I am real pleased to be here for so many reasons. Number one, I am a co-founder of both groups. I'm a co-founder of Spin Storytellers, which was Spin Storytellers of Western New York, and we came together in 1984. I'm also a co-founder of Tradition Keepers, Black Storytellers of Western New York, which came together in 1995. And I'm always reminded, almost every single day, that it was storytelling that first took me into the prisons. I had spent many years telling stories at schools and bookstores and churches and libraries and museums, never thinking about prisons or prisoners. I just did. I was at another program earlier today where I said, as I've often said before, I think I've been an activist for a long, long time. And originally, when I was teaching in Buffalo Public Schools, which I did for 25 years, my activism was for Afrocentric education and for arts and education and for better education all around. I wasn't thinking about prisons or prisoners. And I say this to say, you know that Prisoners Are People Too is the designated charity for this evening. And I am the founder of Prisoners Are People Too. I had difficulty zeroing in on a story that I wanted to share because there are so many stories that I know and that many of you have heard me share, and so many stories related to the work that I do with prisoners and people too. A number of things have come to mind in recent days. First, I want to ask this question. How many of you know a six-year-old? A child, grandchild, yeah. You love them, don't you? Your students, yep. Yeah. Um, they're wonderful and they're beautiful. And they love to play, they love to laugh, they love to learn, and we love to watch them do those things. We love to watch them grow. I recently discovered the story of an enslaved African man who was stolen from his home and stolen from his homeland, which was Guinea, West Africa, when he was six years old. Imagine that. We think about child slavery, and we get all upset about that, but when we think about slavery in this country, we often don't think about the children who were snatched up and brought to the Western Hemisphere. Prince Mortimer was brought to this country as a six-year-old, and he was made to work alongside the adults. Prince Mortimer was enslaved in the state of Connecticut. And that's one thing I emphasize, especially when I'm talking to children, because many of them have the, and some, some adults, have this impression that slavery was only in the South. There was a lot of enslaved, enslaved people right here in the North, Connecticut, New York State. And oftentimes, that, that's not even touched upon, unfortunately, in our children's social studies textbooks. Prince Mortimer was enslaved from the age of six until the age of 87. And at the age of 87, in an, in an attempt to free himself, he tried to poison one of his owners. He put a little arsenic in the chocolate drink. Prince Mortimer was found out. There was no trial. He was convicted of attempted murder, and then he was incarcerated. He was at uh, Newgate Prison for six years, and then later transferred to Wethersfield Prison for 18 years. 
at the age of 103. And at the age of 103, those who were charged with his care and custody, there was a whole lot of custody and not much care, those who were charged with him felt that he was a burden. They didn't want to be bound with him. And so they basically kicked him out of the prison and said, go. Go where? He wasn't a free man. He was an old man. And he rambled around for a bit looking for someone who might care for him, someone who might care about him, someone who might love him, respect him, and not humiliate him or degrade him or debase him as had happened for so many years. But he found no one. So he came back to Wethersfield, and when he got to the gate, he begged to be let in again, because he had nowhere to go. And they did take him in, and they still made him work. He was expected to work. For the last few years of his life, and he died at the age of 111, he was in solitary confinement. And I don't know how many of you know what that means exactly, but you are confined basically to a cell, a cage, a very small space where there is no human contact. And for the last few years of his life, until they joined the ancestors at the age of 111, he was in solitary, in a cage no larger than three and a half feet by seven feet, if you can imagine that. Some of you have bathrooms a whole lot larger than that. But imagine being locked in your bathroom for years and years and so many hours, 23 hours a day. Imagine that. This man spent so many years in captivity and so many years as a prisoner. His story is only little known and there's very little primary source information, but you can look up his name, Prince Mortimer and find out as much as you can about him. I was first attracted to his story when someone noted that his story brought to mind for them what is happening in this country in terms of mass incarceration. You know this country, supposedly the greatest country on the face of the planet, incarcerates more people, more of its population than any other country in the world. That's a sad thing, and this is our country, but this is what happens. Last month, a wonderful man named Herman Wallace joined the ancestors too. After 40 years of incarceration, most of that time spent in solitary confinement. He was repeatedly denied parole because of his involvement many, many, many years ago with the Black Panther Party and with him trying to improve conditions in the prison where he was confined in Louisiana, a prison called Angola, also known as the Farm. He was denied and denied and denied and denied for over 40 years. And as I said, most of that time spent in solitary confinement. Not much has changed in this country over the years. The prison system as it exists today is no better than the plantation that existed so long ago. In fact, the place where Herman Wallace was confined used to be a prison uh, a plantation. Then it became a prison farm. I could go on and on about Herman Wallace and say a little bit more about Prince Mortimer, but I want to say a little bit about my story and how I made some connections. I mentioned teaching in the Buffalo Public Schools for 25 years, or did I? Was that earlier? Okay, I did, thank you very much. Do a lot of programs and all gets kind of crisscrossing and stuff, and I don't know what I'm saying or doing. In fact, when Bobby came up and said this was for Telebration 2013, I want to say, no, 2014. And then I realized it really is still 2013. <laughs> I'm confused. But for the most part, I know what I'm doing. Anyway, after 25 years of teaching in the schools, junior high, high school, I loved it, loved it, loved it. Had some wonderful experiences with my students and my students' parents. 
I resigned from teaching to be a full-time professional storyteller. And everybody thought that was crazy. I knew a fool. You had a safe, steady, secure job that you loved. Why would you leave it to pursue storytelling when you don't know if you're going to get paid, what you might get paid, and you got three children and no man? It's not going to work. But my parents have always said, if there's something in your heart to do, you need to do it. You need to step out of faith, put God first, and do it. And so that's what I did. My children are all adults now. Everybody's fine. I'm doing pretty good. And the storytelling worked. But in that very first year, which was 1994, when I resigned, eight years away from retirement, all I had for an income was storytelling. A lot of blessings came my way. A local radio station, WBLK, invited me to come on the air and tell stories every Monday morning for just a few minutes. They said, we can't pay you. I said, that's OK. It will widen my audience, and maybe someone will hear me, and maybe they'll pay me. And that one month turned into a year, and that one year of storytelling on the radio turned into 10 years. It was a blessing. The opportunity to travel to Africa came from that. That was a blessing. The opportunity to share to so many different audiences, that was a blessing. Responses came from teachers and churches and bookstores and librarians and museums. Karima, could you come and do something for us? Could you tell us some stories? Could you do a workshop? Could you do this, that, and the other thing? And I started hearing from prisoners. That was a surprise. As I said, I never thought about prisons or prisoners. My activism was in another realm. But I got really excited hearing from a whole new audience that found something in my stories. Stories that many of you know too. On the radio, I had to do something quick, short, to the point, and I chose to do Aesop Fables. You know those stories. Prisoners heard those stories, found hope, found comfort, find inspiration, and so much more. There is tremendous power in stories. That very same year, 1994, the first invitation to come into a prison came from Attica. And I will always be grateful to the men at that prison who felt that I had something to offer. Following that, more invitations came from prisons all across the state. And I kept telling stories in these prisons, and I learned so much about what the prison system does and how it impacts, in a very negative way, individuals, their families, and their communities. You will notice on the front of your program, it says that the theme for this evening is connections. And in going into the prisons, I made a lot of connections. I met some very wonderful men women and children who I wished I could have whisked out of those places and brought back out here with me. So many men, women, and children. So many wonderful people. Like that six-year-old Prince Mortimer who was a little boy, just like the six-year-old people you know, who is a human being who has so much to offer, so much to give, so much to be. And I needed to know why they were there. And I started hearing their stories. And I learned so much from them and from people who were prisoner justice advocates. A few years later, in 2002, I was invited to Wendy Correctional Facility for a program that was celebrating Heritage Day. And I was invited to come in and tell two stories. And on that day, I met a very wonderful man. And I'm going to say wonderful again. Wonderful man. <laughs> and he said, don't say too much, because he knows sometimes I'll go off. But I remember coming into the prison that day, and I'm going to try to make this very quick. Um, he was not there. And the men were very angry about us not being there. It wasn't his fault. Something had happened, and he was going to be denied the opportunity to be there. And they wanted him to meet me. I had been to Wendy Correctional many times before. And the men there knew me 
but this man didn't know me, and they wanted us to have an opportunity to meet. And they were really upset that he wasn't going to be allowed to come. And they were kind of slow poking around, setting up things in the gym. And I wanted them to hurry up so we could do this program. And I could tell them stories and go. It's a Saturday. I got to go to the cleaners, the drugstore, the library, the grocery store. The... And lo and behold, when I said, can we move this thing along, a door opens and he comes out. And the men were so excited. I mean, you would have thought he was a rock star or something. I don't know. <laughs> And they were, yeah, Baba, all right. You know, like, who is this man? Well, Baba gave the welcome, and he had an opportunity to speak. He was really good. And I must say, telling the truth, I've been to a lot of prisons where I've heard some incarcerated people speak, and sometimes they say, you know, sometimes you can work on a speech very, very hard, and it just doesn't come out the way you want it to. And you want people to really get it and understand, and there's so much energy, so much passion, but it just doesn't work. And I've heard a lot of speeches like that, but this man was speaking, and he was making good sense. Not only was he making good sense, but he was saying some of the things that I was going to say. I'm like, wait a minute, who is this man? But anyway, I had a wonderful opportunity to meet George Baba Ng. Um, I never thought I would see him again. Although he did ask for the phone number. I have to tell you that. He asked for my phone number and I gave it to him. <laughs> I never did that to anybody. But I figured he probably won't call. And if he does, it'll be a collect call. I don't have to accept it. But he didn't call. He started writing. And that was the hook. <laughs> I learned so much about his story. And it was his story that really captured my attention and really attracted to me to meet him. Help. I learned about his work on the inside, and it made me decide that this is somebody I wanted to support. And with the creation of Prisoners Are People Too, which gave me a bigger voice, I was able to reach more people to share the story and to talk to them about the work we saw as being in the growth of prisoners are people too. On the back of the program, there's a little bit of information about prisoners are people too. And I hope that you will go to our website to read more about us, click on programs to read about the program coming up on Monday about Herman Wallace and a special project he was engaged in, a film called Herman's House, which we will be screening on Monday. Uh, click on Reformed Defenders to read about some of the people that were working to assist to come home. There are a lot of people locked up who should not be. Men, women, and children. Baba is going to speak next and say a little bit uh, about himself and a little bit about the prospects of prisoners or people too. We thank you for being here this evening and we thank you for your donations and you best believe they will be put to good use. We've been doing the, our best to help people, incarcerated, folks coming home, and assisting their families to the best of our abilities. We thank you for your donations and your input. Thank you. I'm honored to be here tonight, and I'm only here by the grace of God and by the work support like you and like my queen. I come here after doing 36 years in prison in New York State for the worst crime that you can imagine. 37 years ago I was a criminal and the act that I committed can never be forgiven or excused, or rationalized, or justified, or even made up for. I took the life of a man who pulled his gun on my wife. And for that, I will forever be sorry, because had I not taken his life, he may have been someone, or grown into someone who could have contributed to my community, to society, in a way that would help us 
from the dire situation that we face right now here in America. Karimo spoke of the connection between prisons, mass imprisonment, and slavery. And as I'm sure all of you know and will agree, slavery was an illegal institution. It was immoral, it was inhuman and ungodly. However, when the, third, when the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, freeing Africans here in America, it was immediately followed by the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. And I don't know if any of you know what the 13th Amendment says, but its words actually say that there shall be no slavery in any state in the United States except upon conviction of a crime. So what that effectively did was that legalized the institution of slavery if someone could be found to be guilty of a crime. When the newly freed African walked off of the plantations here in America, he and she had no identification, had no residence, had no place of employment, and that was a crime, the crime of vagrancy. The criminal justice system as it exists today evolved out of what was known as the Black Codes. And the Black Codes were the rules and regulations used to govern the lives of slaves on the plantations here in America. And the purpose of the Black Codes was to protect the interests of slave owners, which were Africans, property, not to protect or support or enhance the rights of human beings, but to support an immoral institution, an inhumane institution. Mass imprisonment today represents the same kind of inhumanity that was leveled towards millions of Africans here in America forced into slavery. And that inhumanity, in my mind, I often, and the theme of tonight's program is connection, so a lot of connections come to my mind is I have this opportunity to address you. And one of the connections that, that I see is that in order to perpetuate inhumanity, it was necessary to, to demonize a segment of a population, a, set, a class, an underclass, as, as we've come to know it and understand it sociologically. And this demonization, in my mind, connects to what was done in Nazi Germany, to the Jews, where propaganda was used to demonize these human beings to such a point that nobody cared what was done to them. Nobody could see themselves in the atrocities and the horror that was inflicted upon this whole group of people, of human beings, immorally, inhumanely, and unjustly. The prison industrial complex demonizes young, black, Latino, poor white, and so-called minority youth in this country so that you 
feel disconnected from them. Not only disconnected, but fearful of them. To the point where you don't care. We don't care enough about what happens to them in terms of what they have done or haven't done. And even to the point of offenders like me who committed the act that they were accused of and went to prison, our oldest scripture, whether Hebrew or Islamic or Christian, says that when an offense is committed, they turn to God and say, what does God want of me when this happens? And the answer was justice. Justice. So in the context of, of the prison industrial complex today, what is justice? The media, the propaganda machine that demonizes so many people unjustly would have you believe that justice and the criminal justice system is about your security and protecting you from the other, from those who have done wrong or have not done wrong. But to the point where you don't feel any need for a connection, to be involved or to care what happens to them. Whether justice is being served by their imprisonment or not. And I stand here today, and again, going back to connections. But not for God's grace and the support and demand of people just like you, I would have not only remained in prison, but it would have remained in a criminal mindset a distorted way of thinking and behaving that it took me to prison in the first place. When I say had it not been for you, what I mean is that the prison system is not structured to transform lives or to repair lives or to repair the harm to victims of crime and offense as the scripture says, to find justice. Because that's what justice is about. Justice is about the healing of the offense. The healing first of the victim, of the victim's family, of the community that the victim comes from. And then to heal the offender so that the offender doesn't continue to offend. And as I have, takes responsibility for an act of criminal behavior and commits oneself to making amends for that in whatever way the victim or the family or society demands. And I have been privileged since I have been home. And, and my one hope and, and, and wish when I came home was that the community would allow me to work with you in order to solve the problems that you face. That was my only hope for the rest of my life, to be committed to serving the community. And by God's grace, I have been allowed to do that. The community here in Buffalo of social activists individuals and community organizations have embraced me in a way that has allowed me to share the knowledge and skills that I was able to gain because of people like you so that I could come back and do some good work. And again, the connection here is that being among you, I feel at home because I was privileged to earn a degree from the New York Theological Seminary. And the Universalist Unitarian Church is very heavily involved in the seminary's work. So it was people like you who came into the prisons where I served time at to work with prisoners in developing programs that were therapeutic, programs 
that allow prisoners to develop the skills and the knowledge and the determination to come back out and work for the community's interests. And that is the greatest work that I've been privileged to do. So I thank you so much for your, your, your willingness to be a part of what our Creator says that we should be about when offense takes place, and that is redemption and salvation. And your participation and your involvement and your concern and your caring represents that. And I'm forever thankful and grateful to you for that. And Prisoners of People too is very grateful and appreciative of everything that you have done, of the opportunity to speak with you. I wish that I had the whole night to talk to you and to share with you what I believe are relevant analysis of the issues that we face as citizens, as human beings, because we are in a crisis. And as slavery's bottom line was profit and not human beings, the prison industrial complex's bottom line is profit and not people. It's profit and not the protection of society, of the communities. And the way that that, that that transmits in terms of interest to those of us who may be removed from it by class or circumstance or thinking is that as human beings, we are all connected. And sociologically, you know, we have what uh, there are ramifications to all conditions. So when something happens in the inner city, and the youth of the inner city are made vulnerable to a condition that entraps them in the pipeline from school to prison, youth in the suburbs are also made vulnerable. So it's not only my children who are vulnerable, but your children and your grandchildren and your nieces and your nephews who are vulnerable to a prison industrial complex that targets the youth of America as cannon fodder to fill prison cells. The same way that corporations target the natural resources of other countries. The natural resource in America is our youth. Black, Latino, poor white, wealthy white. Because the connection between youth is cultural. And identity in growing up requires that youth see themselves in each other. So when youth from this community out here sees the youth of the inner cities in the rap videos and the negative portrayals, that gets emulated in a way that makes them vulnerable. So we all have a share in making sure that the justice system that we support here in America is a justice system that truly finds justice and transformation. And we call that restorative justice. And that's what we work for. So I thank you for your time and for your attention. And I pray that God continue to bless and protect all of you and us. And to keep our hearts open and our will and determination to do His, Her will as the divine season. Thank you very much.